Uh, what I'd like to do uh, in this presentation, it's a, it's a short presentation, but uh, maybe make a bit of a, of a shift. And uh, this is uh, uh, very much less theoretical, but it's, it's a practical application. And in the, in the world today, in the world of oil refining, uh, fluidized catalytic cracking, FCC, is, is absolutely the heart of uh, most high conversion refineries today. And uh, in fact, uh, the FCC, uh, its development in 1942, genuinely has uh, changed the face of the planet. Uh, the Earth would not look today probably what it does now if it were not for this technology. It's a, it's a very large, a very expensive uh, asset, but it uh, produces uh, quite a, uh, um, a volume expansion in the refinery, and it produces, uh, it's, a, it's a huge uh, volume stream. And so, since there are so not since not everyone in this room is an FCC expert, I thought I would just briefly go through what an FCC is for a couple of slides, and then get into the heart of the presentation. And so, here is a, is a, a simple FCC side by side unit. Um, this here actually is the reactor vessel itself. It's a plug flow tubular reactor uh, extending up into the sky. At the end of the riser. We disengage into either directly coupled or close coupled cyclones. The uh, hydrocarbons are uh, taken off to fractionation. Catalyst flows uh, by gravity down into a stripper. In a stripper, we use uh, steam to uh, mechanically separate uh, hydrocarbon vapors uh, from the catalyst. And then the catalyst is then uh, pneumatically transported into uh, basically a converter, a uh, combustor which in the in terminology of the industry is a regenerator. Uh, the regeneration occurs here in the dense phase, and, uh, and then the, uh, the hot catalyst is then uh, recycled back into the riser for another step. And then this is shown in the notes uh, by arrows. And so we have uh, hot catalyst going into the riser. We have feed being injected. Feed is, uh, the reaction is uh, highly endothermic. One of the byproducts of the reaction is carbon that lays down on the active sites of the catalyst. The catalyst uh, then deactivates due to uh, active site occlusion. The uh, catalyst eventually uh, finds its way into the stripper. We use uh, mechanical uh, stripping to take the, uh, the entrained hydrocarbons out. That uh, catalyst is then pneumatically transported into the regenerator where it's burnt. And if the combustion occurs here in the dense phase, we're fat, dumb, and happy, ready to go on. Uh, unfortunately, in, in, uh, in many units, the combustion actually occurs here in the dilute phase. And so now that uh, we're all FCC experts, um, we can answer the question, what is afterburn? Afterburn is, is any combustion that occurs outside of the dense phase. And that can be in the dilute phase, in the cyclones, in the plenum, even in the, in the flue gas line uh, downstream. And uh, if it is uh, uncontrolled, it'll cause uh, massive metallurgical damage to the unit. In, in practice, no one will allow their unit to degrade due to afterburn. And so the standard, the standard move is, is to either inject a CO promoter, which is a platinum or palladium-based additive that will force the combustion back down into the dense bed. And, uh, and then together with that, usually refiners have to pull charge rate. They have to reduce the charge. Uh, and this is, this, is an imp this is an important unit. And so you're not able to process as much feed as you want, so it costs uh, lost opportunity. Here we have, I have an image uh, taken in a regenerator. So if you can imagine, you, you've just entered into the regenerator. It's shut down. Uh, it's hydrocarbon free. It's, it's safe for entry. And, uh, these uh, cross members here in the planks are the scaffolding, and now you're looking up, and what you're seeing here are the dip legs of regenerators, and you can see that uh, there's been some pretty massive damage to the cyclones. And so that is what uncontrolled uh, afterburn does in a unit. And uh, you know, you would think that uh, this is a, a fairly mature industry, it's been around for over 70 years, and that afterburn would be controlled. But the truth is, based on, on the number of refiners that are injecting CO promoters, approximately a third of the refiners that are operating today have this problem. And this is a, a rate limiting problem. And so now we get into the heart of, of the presentation. Uh, a particular refiner in the Gulf Coast was, uh, was having a structural afterburn problem. Uh, they were afterburning at a rate of about 50 degrees, which is pretty massive. Uh, and that's uh, with platinum injection. 
And so they wanted to understand the root cause, and they wanted to solve it. And so the result is, is given here. They uh, uh, employed CPFD, and the CPF, uh, CPFD engineers uh, evaluated it, found the root cause, worked together with the refiner and uh, their chosen engineering company to find a solution. This presentation uh, gives a little bit of an overview of that process. And so this is what the regenerator itself looked like. It had three sets of primary, secondary cyclones. It had a uh, spent cat distributor. And uh, you can imagine it, the uh, spent catalyst is being pneumatically transported vertically, makes a 90, makes another 90 down, and then in principle it's being spread out across the, the, uh, at least the center of the dense bed, in theory. And then there's a couple of rings here for air distribution, and then uh, the regenerated catalyst is taken out from the bottom. And so here we have uh, the animations of what the unit looks like. Uh, the left image is, is the full 3D. You can see here the, uh, a fairly good uh, differentiation between the dense bed and the dilute phase. This is a cut plane uh, with centers on the spent cat distributor. And I, I draw your attention to the western hemisphere of this regenerator. What you see is uh, the spent catalyst is being brought in with air, and that air together with uh, what's coming in from the rings is maldistributing and mainly going up the western hemisphere of the regenerator. The eastern hemisphere of the regenerator is, is, is pretty silent. There's not much going on. So significant channeling. And now if we zoom in on the distributor itself, we see something quite interesting. Uh, first off, uh, you see that the catalysts have flown along the walls, and that, that makes sense. If it didn't, cyclones would not work. Whenever you force the catalyst to make a turn, it's going to flow along the walls. And so in, in my simple way of thinking, I would have thought, just looking at the, at the distributor design, that it's probably not bad. But what we actually see is that the catalyst makes a turn, it's 180 down, but then almost immediately it's swept up by the uh, combustion gases and carried out of the dense bed. And so the majority of the burn in this unit is not occurring in the dense bed. It's occurring in the, in the dilute phase, thus a 50 degree rise. And so here is uh, some combustion profiles. Left image is, is temperature, middle image is oxygen, and then the right image is carbon monoxide. And uh, as these come to equilibrium on the temperature, I would draw your attention to this region here. And what you'll begin to observe is, is that there's a cool zone, a cold zone, uh, relative to the rest of the bed. The cold zone comprises about half of the regenerator. In the oxygen, you'll find that uh, most of the oxygen is flowing through the center of the regenerator, and the carbon monoxide is taking its way up uh, on, in the western hemisphere uh, in the cool zone. This is brought out in, in my mind, uh, uh, it's more easily seen in the time averaged uh, combustion patterns. And what we see here is really remarkable. So it, it's cold, albeit it's still pretty hot. You wouldn't want to touch it. It's uh, 1,320 degrees here in this zone here. And, and here and on this side here, it's operating at closer to 1,370 degrees. But there's, there's virtually uh, no combustion, relatively speaking, occurring in the western half, in half of the regenerator. The oxygen is flowing up the center. Oxygen is flowing up the center. The uh, carbon monoxide is, uh, is taking its uh, route up the, uh, the western hemisphere. And the two come together right here in the dilute phase. And it's interesting that uh, this cut plane is, is uh, pretty close to where the, where the dense bed ends. It's a, the dense bed is a little bit lower than that cut plane. But you can see that, uh, that the burning is occurring outside of the dense bed. So this is a problem. And this is the, uh, the root cause. The, the root cause of this is maldistribution. And it's a poor catalyst distribution that is aggravated by the, uh, the combustion gases that come in with the spent catalyst. And so uh, one, one last look at this. If, if you look at the temperature profile and consider the impact on the uh, CO combustion, what you find is, is that the rate of CO combustion here in the hot zones compared to here in the cold zone is, is almost 65% less. And so because of the temperature profile here, 
the CO really doesn't start igniting until it until it exits the let's see until it exits the bed and enters into the dilute phase. Okay, so so we're not interested in academic studies. The the bottom line is is that this is this is a very expensive piece of asset. And it's the crucial asset in this refinery. And it's limiting the refinery's uh, profitability. And so the, uh, uh, the engineers at uh, CPFD recommended uh, might not be a bad idea to look at your spent cat distributor. And the, uh, the refiner agreed to it. They went to, a, uh, to their chosen uh, engineering company. And they had a proposal. And the proposal was for improved spent catalyst distribu distribution and also an alternate way of handling the, uh, the gases that are used to pneumatically transport the spent catalyst. And, uh, but the important point is, and I'd like to emphasize this, uh, in fact, it's, it's the key, it's the key. What they, the refiner did was not simply um, say thank you for the results and, and walked away. What they did was they worked with their engineering company and then uh, uh, recommended that, that there be a three-way uh, collaboration between the refiner, between the engineering company, and between CPFD. And then so uh, the end result of the engineering company's work was sent back to CPFD and they, and they put it into the model again. And what we show here is a side-by-side uh, -side comparison of their work uh, on a temperature scale. Here's the baseline before the modification and with the new design. And because of the proprietary nature of the distributor, it's been occluded. We don't have the details shown. So here we see again half of the uh, dense bed is, uh, is cold, it's not burning. Here in the new, in the new uh, design, in the new design, uh, the, uh, there is a, a complete elimination of that cold zone. And if we look at the CO2, or the CO, in the, in the baseline, the CO was burning up here in the dilute phase, and here it's almost entirely eliminated. And so the, this shows the value of collaboration. And uh, this uh, new design has been installed in the unit. The unit has been started up, and uh, we're, uh, we're now waiting, expecting any time now to get the results, uh, the, the actual results in the operating unit. And so in conclusion, uh, this unit obviously was uh, uh, significantly maldistributing. Although it is, it is absolutely obvious what's going on with CPFD, if you're an engineer, a process engineer, it's not obvious what's going on. And by using CPFD, we were able to actually identify the root cause. And then, uh, as I mentioned, there was a collaborative approach, which we believe is, is the model for the future. And uh, the end result was uh, a, uh, what we believe to be a very elegant solution to a long-term problem in this refinery. And so this is the recommendation that CPFD has, is uh, uh, let's not work just in the front end, let's work on the back end. That's my presentation.